Hello. Welcome to the July episode of Drawing Out the Dreaming, where I share with you my deep love of plants and how I work with them and paint them. It's certainly been a month of mixed weather here in the Cotswolds, but all our roses bloomed anyway, and the garden's grateful for the rain we've had in the past few days after so much heat. I thought I'd show you the layout of our garden. This is a sketch that John did a very long time ago. It's on four different levels on the side of a south-facing cliff. When we moved here 34 years ago, we began clearing the land from the chapel, working outwards and upwards. We added the sunroom first, then John built the little waterfall. He made it from the old stone tiles that came off our roof. Then, later on, he expanded the little arbour next to the waterfall so it had room for a table and chairs. It's probably the place that we spend most time. Since this map was sketched, we've more recently added the moon dial to our small lawn. Originally, I grew vegetables to feed my family, but now the children are grown up, I've turned the vegetable beds into a perennial herb garden. I dry a lot of the plants to use throughout winter. The box hedges keep the badgers out and they protect the herbs from the wind. John built the steps up the steep limestone cliff, following the contours. They've lasted quite well. Originally, we designed the garden as an allegory of life's journey. The paths divide at the top of the cliff. There's a choice of walking through the fruitful orchard, which represents family life, or taking the path of inner contemplation to the quiet pond house. The paths then reconnect at the top level of the garden. We inherited several derelict goat sheds with our land and John used the basis of these to build the garden follies, including the children's play tower. Since this map was drawn, the top level of the garden has grown into woodland since I planted seven multi-stemmed silver birches. It's good to have some dappled light and shade on hot days. The orchard is now underplanted with meadow flowers such as oxeye daisies and knapweed, snakes head fritillaries in spring, but it's grown wilder and wilder over the last few years. In the year 2000, John completed a wall painting on the east wall of the chapel. It had taken him two years and it depicts our friends and neighbours arriving to celebrate midsummer in our garden. The lives of so many people depicted have changed so much since then and we've lost some dear friends, so it's really precious to have a visual memory of them that we see every day. The St John's fire is at the heart of the garden, and the green man presides over the celebration. Our children are at the top with us. They were 12 and 16 then. I'll take you on a quick tour of the lower garden to show you some of the roses that are slowly climbing up the cliff. They're underplanted with various cranes bills and alliums and foxgloves and catmint. Our soil is thin and free draining. It dries out very easily. I mulch it in spring to keep in as much moisture as possible. Plants like Salvia turkestanica thrive in it and I love to paint it. I originally planted 70 roses in the garden but not all have survived. Buff Beauty was one of the first roses I planted, and she's an old lady now. She's been with us nearly 30 years. The Clematis Marjorie grows through her, and flowers just as she starts flowering, but ends before her. More recently, I've planted climbers to scramble up the cliff in amongst the ivy, and some of them are Phyllis Bide, Paul's Himalayan Musk, one of my favourites, a white Banksia, and a Sanders white. There are others I can't remember the name of. Rosa mutabilis is one of my very favourites. I love the way there are so many different coloured flowers on the one plant. The scent from all the roses is most powerful in the evenings and this month I'm going to share with you how I make aromatic rose water. I collect the flower heads when the dew has dried on them but before the sun gets too hot Roses have been cultivated for thousands of years and fossilised remains have been found. They were believed to have originated in Central Asia. 
There are records of rose water being made in Persia in 2000 BC. Rosa Damascena is known as the apothecary's rose, and that's the rose most commonly used in herbal medicine because of its fragrance. Rose medicine has a long history of medicinal virtues and was believed to lift the spirits, open the heart, quieten the mind and soothe the soul. It is a gentle diuretic and cools the skin and digestion. But rose offers so much more. I found that sharing rose tea with a friend seems to help open motions, break down barriers and the scent swiftly takes people back to childhood memories. These certainly may not always be happy memories, but unlocking past traumas can be valuable in helping us to understand ourselves better and to gain perspective. In the doctrine of signatures, the soft velvet flowers and the thorny stems indicate the complex nature of what Rose offers us. The petals are gentle and safe, Yet the thorns symbolise the barriers of protection that we can form around our heart to protect us from emotional pain. The fragile, fleeting beauty of the flowers, once cut, remind us to live in the moment and to appreciate beauty in its season, however brief. To make aromatic rose water, I put the petals individually into the belly of the copper still and then cover them in water. I like to use spring water from our village well. It takes a lot of flowers just to make aromatic rose water, but to make rose absolute, the essential oil of Rosa Damascena, takes infinitely more. Once the rose water is heated up enough to produce steam, this travels through the neck and into the coil, which is full of cold water. This condenses it, and the liquid that drips out slowly is delicately scented. I store this in the fridge, and it's refreshing as a face spray on hot days. You can dampen the sheets with it on hot nights to feel fragrant and cool. I like to have my herbal books and dried plants around me in the house. It keeps me connected to my studies and to the plants, even on dark winter nights. I often refer to the books for inspiration for paintings. Throughout this last year, I've been working on the series of divination illuminations that I mentioned in a previous video. These will be a set of oracle cards and our third publication in the Weeds in the Heart project that I've been working on with Nathaniel Hughes for the past few years. I'm hoping to have the first 15 of them completed in time for my studio exhibition with John in late October this year. There'll be 33 herb cards in all, so that's at least another year's work ahead. I've loved working on these paintings. I felt completely absorbed in each plant as I've been working with it, and the paintings seem to take on a life of their own. I've often had the sensation that I'm a passive observer, just watching the picture be painted out in front of me. There is a fine framework of gilded sacred geometry within each illumination, and each illumination contains part of a whole design that represents a portal through a symbolic eye into the world of the plant. I'm finally completing the outer borders now, which reference the mosaic skies in the Ravenna cycle in Italy. At each corner, there will be the plant's planetary, ochem, room and moon phase correspondence specific to that plant. The relevant totemic animals, birds and insects in each illumination come from dreaming with each plant. I seem to have phases of dreaming about specific animals. There were weeks dreaming about a white swan, followed by several dreams of rooks and crows, and most recently a black bull, which has yet to find its way into my paintings. I'm planning to make some of these illuminations into plant spirit invocation cabinets, containing the essence of the plant in medicine form, as well as a dried specimen, like my first fly agaric cabinet that I made last year. Recently, we visited a friend in Herefordshire, and he took us to some wonderful allotments near Lemster. There were more than 50 plots, all tended and individual and full of colour. John particularly loves painting allotments, so he found it very inspiring. 
He's always been particularly fascinated with the challenge of painting light in all its forms, through mist and rain and water, even light bouncing off a plastic polytunnel. This series of oil paintings of allotments will be in our next studio exhibition later in the year. Having been married for over 40 years now, it's interesting that we always share the same experiences, but paint our impressions of them in such very different ways. I'll just give you a quick tour of our kitchen path now as it's changing through the seasons. All the springtime violas and pansies have now been replaced by geraniums and osteospermums. White mallow and Mexican fleabane has seeded itself here and there in the gravel and I've put the dahlias out in pots. The love in the mist is self-sown and I leave it there for the seeds to ripen so it can perpetuate its cycle. This pathway gets narrower each year as it gets more crowded with plants. It's quite a raggle-taggle mix of salvias, dahlias, cosmos. But because it's just outside the kitchen, it's easy to pop out daily to tend to them. Many of the dahlias haven't even started flowering yet, so it's exciting to look forward to some late summer colour this year. I've never grown them before, so I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with them in winter. I'm amazed at how quickly they grow. I dug up most of the ones I'd planted in the herb garden because the slugs seem to be enjoying them too much, but I've left three or four. They seem to be big enough and sturdy enough to survive the slugs now. My herb garden has never been fuller than this year and I really feel it's got away from me now decided to just sit back and enjoy the performance rather than try to stage manage it. Before the pandemic began, we used to spend our summers in Italy, often being away for six to eight weeks painting there. So this is the first summer in a long time I've been able to enjoy the garden at this time of year. Many plants have surprised me and I realise I've never seen them flower before. I like to know they carry on regardless of whether they're being witnessed or not. I usually start harvesting the herbs in early September and carry on until the frosts. Hopefully there's a lot more summer to enjoy yet. Meanwhile, I wish you all a happy and healthy summer and may the plants be with you.